Thank you for the kind introduction and thanks to everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here this evening. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the Coast Salish People's Territory on which we're meeting, uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Um, I'm here today to talk about putting theory into practice. I think my presentation's about 45 minutes, so hopefully you can put up with it for that long. And I understand there will be discussion afterwards, which I really look forward to. And um, I often get asked to talk about treaties, what they are and what they mean. And I've sat on panels to hear many people talk about the theory of self-government and principles of what sovereignty is. And I often hear challenges to treaties from a theoretical perspective in terms of principles that people cannot accept or compromises that First Nations should not be willing to make. And I appreciate all that dialogue as it helps inform everyone in respect of the basis of so much of the work we do. But ultimately, those dialogues have to get translated to paper and have to get signed off as treaties or reconciliation agreements or whatever form works for individual First Nations. Obviously, that dialogue and those agreements are crucial, but in my view, it's only step one because the next step is to take that paper and put those agreements into practice, a process that takes the abstract notions discussed in negotiating reconciliation agreements, or in my case, the term papers I did in the past, and transforms them into concrete, a concrete structure that reflects the reality on the ground uh, for a given First Nation. And very few groups have done that in Canada and in the treaty context, there are only two modern treaties in BC, with another couple on the way. There are others across the country in the Yukon and Northwest Territories, uh, among other places. And there are also two self-governing First Nations in BC that don't have land claim settlement agreements. So with so few groups, it's often easy to lapse back into a high-level talk of theory and intent and principles. And in my discussion with you today, I want to try and bring the treaty dialogue down to earth and what it means to the members of my community. What does it mean to the broader community? And for Tuas and our treaty effective day was on April 3rd. This is extremely real to us. We live it every single day. And it's having real impacts on individuals and families and on our community. But we haven't even seen close to the potential that our treaty will offer us. That will be realized over the next five, 10 years and beyond. So I'll start by giving you a bit of background about Tawasin and about our treaty, what it comprises of and what some of the key components are. Then I'll speak a little about our approach to the treaty, where we are coming from and how that influenced us and some of the key elements of our agreement. And I'll talk about why we found that compromising to reach a treaty was a more effective solution for us, for us than holding out for the best of all possible worlds. Finally, I'll talk about some of the impacts of the final agreement that we already see at Tawasin, And I'll touch on what I call my reconciliation model because the treaty is not the only answer and there are different solutions that can fit particular circumstances. But I'll explain why I think that the most fulsome kind of reconciliation involves self-governance, uh, and that's what it takes to be most successful. So first, let me speak a bit about Tawasin and a bit about our treaty, which came into effect, as I said, on April 3rd. Tawasin is unique, not only as a treaty first nation, but because we're, on, we're in a very urban setting. We're situated at the south end of Metro Vancouver, a region with some of the most intense land development pressures and highest per acre land values in North America. It's a vibrant growing region in which the opportunities are immense, but where the challenges facing a small culturally and economically isolated population are just as immense. We're a Coast Salish nation. Our traditional territory extends over the southern Gulf Islands and northeast across Delta to Surrey and up into the Pitt Lake watershed. Traditionally, we're very wealthy people living at the confluence of the ocean and one of the world's most productive rivers. We faced many of the same challenges Aboriginal peoples in Canada have faced since the arrival of Europeans. 
beginning with the terrible debilitating impacts of smallpox and including the impacts of the Indian Act, residential schools, and the loss of our traditional livelihood due to the destruction of habitat. Currently, we number just over 400 members and we're growing fast. Around half of our members live on our lands and the rest are spread out through BC, Washington State and elsewhere in Canada. Now for a few words on the treaty, I'm not sure what the average level of awareness about it is in this room, so I apologize if this is old news for anyone, but I'm gonna start at a real basic level so that I uh, don't leave anyone behind, so to speak. We, uh, as a self-governing First Nation operating under the terms of the final agreement with BC and Canada, which after receiving legislative approval in both the provincial and federal legislative chambers, and it was ratified by our membership in 2007, it came to effect uh, just about a year and a half ago. The Tuasin Treaty includes both a land claim settlement and a self-government agreement. The land claim agreement involved the transfer of 724 hectares of land previously held either by the Federal Crown for the benefit of the now obsolete Indian Reserve or Indian Ban or by the province of BC. And the land that was transferred to Tuasan on effective date included the former reserve as well as surrounding lands, both contiguous and non-contiguous in the southwest quadrant of the lower mainland. The settlement was the resolution of our undefined Aboriginal title claim over our traditional territory. We agreed to modify our rights to what is defined in the treaty, and those rights include uh, hunting, fishing, and gathering rights in our larger traditional territory. Our primary resources are salmon and crab, as other resources are scarce in our core territory. And a major issue this touches on that I don't have time to speak to today, but want to acknowledge as important is that of overlaps and shared territories uh, with other First Nations, because it becomes really important when speaking of resource use. So we agreed to take our lands in fee simple under this regime. Our lands are all registered in the BC Land Title Office, and uh, the Legal regime of the Land Title Act guarantees certainty and security of tenure while ensuring that the land base is protected and that our members have the freedom to develop their lands. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm coming down with a cold, so you'll have to bear with me. It's courtesy of those three little kids. <laughs> The self-government aspect of our treaty is the ability for us to make our own laws governing many areas of jurisdiction. And this includes land management. Our lands are now in the sole control of our community. And we have passed rules governing the management development process as well as ownership and title frameworks. Another critical element of Tawasan's jurisdiction is in respect of social programming. We have jurisdiction over aspects of healthcare, education, post-secondary education, social assistance, child and family services, and many others. We also received a number of financial transfers on the effective day, comprising of a capital transfer, an implementation fund, and several other specific funds and payments. And the order of magnitude of the cash was around uh, a $15 million capital transfer and $30 million implementation fund over time. We will also receive ongoing fiscal transfers from the federal and provincial governments for the operation of programs and services. Although that funding is subject to own source revenue agreements that claw back our transfers as we develop our own revenue. A number of other side agreements coexist with the final agreement and set out all the commitments each government made to each other on our effective day. These includes the aforementioned own source revenue agreement, a fiscal financing agreement, tax treatment agreement, real property tax coordination agreement, harvest agreement, and several others. Many of these agreements, such as the own source revenue agreement, deal uh, with the complicated and difficult trade-offs that we faced when we made the decision on whether and how to move forward. <coughs> My staff are terrible for putting that there. Um, so 
that is a bit about Tawasan and the final agreement itself, but why did we decide to pursue it in the first place? When I was about 19, I took some courses at Kwantlen College that dealt with the history and status of Aboriginal people. And of course, I compared what I learned with what I saw every day in my community and the kinds of real impacts that history and government decisions had had on our people. I asked myself why the situation had gotten so bad and what tools might be available to deal with it. And I read up on the concepts of Aboriginal rights and learned more and more about some of the terrible transgressions of the Indian Act. And the more I read, the more convinced I became at the idea that Tuasan needed a better set of tools to overcome our situation and our poor conditions. And over time, I came to realize that we had to get away from the Indian Act as well, and that moving away from this terrible, oppressive regime was the only way we're going to be able to grow again as a people. So I asked the chief of the day, Tony, if I might work with him to this regard, and he took me on as a land claims researcher. And it was from there I had pieced together our people's Aboriginal rights and title background, working towards a federal comprehensive claim submission. I was delighted to instead uh, send it off as an application to uh, the newly emerged BC Treaty process instead. Later, when I became chief, I also became chief negotiator and continued to vigorously pursue the treaty process. I took every opportunity to move Tawasan away from Indian Act during the pre-treaty world. We took land management powers under the First Nation Land Management Act, and we also took membership and election jurisdiction to the extent possible, which means to the extent that Indian Affairs permitted us to do so. So while I gloss over this bit, I should note that it took 12 years in the treaty process to finalize the agreement. So initially we had entered into treaty negotiations mainly out of a principles-based approach to resolving the expropriation we as a First Nation and the busy Lower Mainland have faced, uh, having the majority of our core traditional lands developed, paved, and our traditional way of our life in those areas forever changed, with no possibility of ever reclaiming that land. Our approach to treaty negotiations was very much grounded in important principles, and we sought relief and freedom through the jurisdiction and ownership of land that was rightfully ours. But as negotiations became more complex, and as we moved through the stages of developing the tools that the final agreement would provide, we came to realize that the treaty was a pragmatic way of dealing with many tangible local issues head on and to provide a structured way to start fresh. So one example of how a practi uh, practical issue for us and our economic pursuits pre-treaty informed our treaty negotiations was the issue of access to a water system. We've been subject to a service uh, agreement with the Corporation of uh, Delta since the 1930s. And since around 1989, we had attempted to acquire water and sewer from Delta, our neighboring municipality, to pursue economic development activities, but to no avail. They had a low growth strategy which conflicted with my community's desire to build an economy. And at the height of our issues with Delta, which is around the mid-90s, we had pre-sold 75% of our first phase of a condo project that totaled 86 units known as Satsu Shores. Discussions on water servicing collapsed. And we had a legal commitment to our prospective buyers and felt strongly that our jurisdiction could not be usurped by the municipality. So we constructed a very, very expensive reverse osmosis treatment plant and tertiary treatment plant, uh, sewer plant, to service these condominiums. We then faced challenges from DFO criminal charges, actually, relating to the site we had chosen for the plant, their argument being that we were on red zone fish habitat. Leading up to the criminal court case, DFO raided our offices our development partners' offices, INAC, and our banks. INAC also created a brand new permitting process for plants on reserve, which they've now abandoned. This has now left our plant in jurisdictional limbo for a long time. During our failed attempts to secure water from Delta prior to the construction of our plant, we had approached the Greater Vancouver Regional District, now Metro Vancouver, to provide another option for water. 
After several months of review, they determined that their legislation did not permit them to provide us with water service either. And I can't recall how many federal and provincial ministers we had spoken to to try and intervene in this situation. Aside from some mediation support attempts, no one would intervene on our behalf. I came to the conclusion that the current political and legal frameworks, federally and provincially, provide for limited successes for intergovernmental relations between First Nations, local and regional governments. I realized that my community servicing issues are on extreme scale, but having seen many other First Nations with similar problems tells me there's no real workable framework that compels First Nations and local government or regional governments to work well together. And so we look to the treaty to fix this real issue. We're not a municipal government and we never will be. Our governance powers are quite different. We didn't want to assimilate to local government as it is not a culturally appropriate institution, despite that most of what we heard was that local governments wanted us to become more like local government. Instead, we insisted that we would be a First Nation member of Metro Vancouver and that we would negotiate with Metro Vancouver on certain provisions, including how we interface with them. Essentially, we agreed to a framework where we became integrated into the existing governance structure while maintaining our distinctness. And by doing so, we solved our water servicing issue. That particular negotiation was a lot of hard work as we were breaking new ground it came about because of some very difficult problems that we needed to solve. And importantly, we feel that we were able to overcome the theoretical of whether we're a local government or not. And in the end, are proud that we are the first First Nation member of GVRD. And let me tell you firsthand that it's very apparent at meetings of the GVRD that we're not simply another municipal member. We are a treaty First Nation that is integrated politically into the broader community through our treaty. We have embarked on an entirely new model of municipal First Nation relationships, and so far it's working. We're having a better working relationship with Delta now, <clears throat> and are working together to solve servicing problems such as sewer that will benefit both our communities. That's only one example, and we have several more, such as solving a land shortage, removing key land from the agricultural land reserve, and clarifying jurisdiction with respect to legal frameworks that applied to us. But I hope you can see how we made the treaty work for us in terms of solving serious practical problems that were stopping us from moving forward. While the treaty provides us with a number of opportunities and solves many practical problems, I want to acknowledge that the treaty is also a series of compromises between the governments of BC and Canada and Tawasan First Nation it's no secret that both BC and Canada have political and policy agendas for both the treaty process specifically and for our treaty in particular. We accepted compromises on many aspects, including OSR agreements where Canada will do 50% clawback of funding for every dollar we make. Another example of serious compromise on our part was the removal of the tax exemption for our current members. This was one of the most difficult aspects of the treaty for my membership to swallow. And there continues to be a lot of angst over this as people dread the day they'll lose their property sales and income tax exemptions. We also agree to a certainty model that worries us and that we give up past claims and don't know if we got everything right. We had to get beyond this to look at the real risk we were managing compared to the benefits. My least favorite compromise we made is that of uh, constitutional status of our lands. And this slide is actually more about how there's no resources in our territory. So fishing is one of the resources we have. But when it comes to constitutional status of our lands, as in the Niska Treaty, the three parties of our treaty agree to disagree. We all agree that our lands are no longer federal but we couldn't agree what they are now. So I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on this section just to illustrate the theory versus the reality. First Nations people and lawyers practicing Aboriginal law have worried that treaty lands may be deemed provincial. 
Myself, I would assert that these lands fall under Section 35 of the Constitution, but senior governments would probably disagree. For years, I have said that the potential for these lands to be deemed provincial is an unacceptable premise. The first question that challenged me was why? What does it matter? And to which I answered that the provincial government had denied Aboriginal title for over a century, on top of the fact that we have no relationship with the province or the fact that the province isn't capable of dealing with First Nation issues. I was then asked, okay, so what is the worst thing that could happen if this was the case and they were de deemed provincial somehow? I didn't really know how to answer this and I'm still waiting for someone to illuminate me on this fact. I was then asked, how would our lands ever end up being deemed to belong under Section 92 of the Constitution? To which I said, well, the courts could make that, de that determination somehow. And then the, I was asked, well, how would it even get to the courts? And I didn't really know the answer to this either, although I'm sure I could come up with some scenarios. But I was challenged with these questions because I came to realize that re the real risk was becoming more and more remote as I s thought through this premise, as offensive as it was, it became quite remote as far as its impact to the day-to-day -day lives of my community. In our case, the real risk was becoming the consequences of not doing anything. How many more youth would be sacrificed while waiting for a perfect agreement? What is the cost of waiting for a perfect arrangement? Especially when I think the odds of us are stacked against a perfect arrangement when we are dealing with not so perfect institutions that have failed us since European contact. I came to the conclusion that the costs of doing nothing were more severe than the potential risk regarding the constitutional status of the lands. So it was through soul searching on a number of issues like this, we came to the conclusion that we had a treaty we could live with and that would take us forward as a community and that fit our community. And this is our way towards reconciliation, but we understand that these are crazy-making issue, issues for First Nation communities, especially with our social problems and capacity issues. But to me, it was a clear example of how a clear understanding of the practical implications of a treaty outweighed the theoretical risks. Luckily, there are other models being tested, and First Nations are going forward with what works for them, because ultimately, in my view, any progress towards reconciliation and self-governance is better than waiting for the perfect storm. <clears throat> and speaking of reconciliation, I want to spend a bit of time talking about what it means to me. I gave you a bit of the history of our community, but let me touch on it again to explain why this is a critical topic. And the central element of my address to the BC Legislature at the introduction of our final agreement, Tawasan and all other First Nations had plenty of capacity, plenty of resources and very strong communities prior to the arrival of Europeans. We governed ourselves according to a set of customs, laws and traditions, which guided our actions as surely as any law on the other side of the Atlantic. We had all we needed for food, we had warm, safe shelter, and we had healthy families. So when we talk about moving forward, we're not looking to start from scratch. We're looking to pick up the pieces of the community we were not long ago. In this context, reconciliation is as much about internal resurrection as it is about external mending of relationships and external recognition of First Nations as legitimate self-governing communities. So what does reconciliation look like? To me, it's a hierarchy of three specific components. The first most basic element is compensation and redress. The second and next level element is relationship building. And the third, which is the most important but often overlooked component of reconciliation, is governance. The first component is about correcting historical wrongs. I've given you a broad brush overview of some of, these, uh, some of those wrongs. Redress is so important because we can't move forward until we turn our back on the terrible injustices of the past. The evolution of law in BC has shown that First Nations can pose considerable risk to the viability of projects in this province as they seek redress for past harm. 
Redress for past impacts seems to be the number one issue First Nations have on their mind when looking at new projects. And I would argue that while agreements with provisions of compensation for redress are important, they're really only one step in that I do not believe that they finish the work of correcting historic wrongs. Ultimately, the long-term harm must be addressed by overcoming the systemic problems our people face through good governance. And I'll speak to uh, this a little more in a, in a minute, but I always remember the now departed Chief Joe, Joe Mathias used to say, there is no amount of money that can correct the indignities and injustices our people have had to face in the past. Indeed, we viewed the financial package of our treaty as simply a gesture of redress because it's such a small amount. The second aspect of reconciliation is the new relationship component. In my view, this is really about the external governance elements and the external recognitions of our government. Relationships are important to First Nations, whether it's with business, government, or others. The challenge has been to figure out who we are as a legal entity, as a government, and as a people within the context of the Canadian Federation. Seeking this answer meant redefining how we related to the federal government without the Indian Act, to the provincial government, to the municipality of Delta, to Metro Vancouver Regional District, and ultimately to the people living around us. And ultimately it was the treaty that gave us some certainty around the new relationship externally, providing us with, among other things, a seat at the Metro Vancouver table, our own municipal plus type status in the provincial legislation that provides we are treated at least equivalent to municipalities by the province, and self-government jurisdiction that removed us entirely from the Indian Act. This helps legitimize our constitution as a distinct community because we have a legal framework that identifies us as a peer community to others. Now for the third and I feel most often overlooked component of reconciliation, governance, the writings of wrongs in most cases is not accomplished through the simple stroke of a pen and redress and compensation the colonial toolkit was very sophisticated and effective at severely compromising our communities in every way imaginable. Specific agreements can provide some financial redress or other compensation, but ultimately uh, correcting historical wrongs means looking after our own community. And it means trying to build trust again within our community. And by trying to restore the elements of accountability and self-government that the Indian Act destroyed, we're ensuring that members' decisions are reflected in community actions. Ultimately, this will lead to a healthy community and a stronger community. In my view, this governance element is the most critical to achieving full reconciliation. While I fully support the other approaches that BC and some First Nations are trying in order to seek reconciliation, I feel that tools for fulsome governance, which at the moment are only achieved through the treaty process, are the most important. And if it's not a treaty that a First Nation chooses, if it's some sort of revenue sharing or some model of partnership that changes relationships, it has to work properly on the ground. So that's a little bit on Tawasan's approach to reconciliation. You can tell that the treaty was central vehicle for us in achieving reconciliation. But you can also see that it's not simply about the agreement and about walking away. The agreement is just a starting point it's what, come af what comes after that matters most. Having uh, discussed some of the background to our final agreement in both concrete and theoretical terms, I want to share a few of the on-the-ground impacts with you that we've witnessed leading up uh, and in the 18 months since we took our first uh, steps on our new journey on April 3rd of last year. We implemented 23 laws on the effective day, including our constitution, developed as the result of a two and a half year community process. The effective date followed a massive 18 month push to prepare for treaty, during which we prepared to jump into self-government with both feet. We took down almost every head of power that the final agreement provided for in terms of jurisdiction as we wanted to assert our self-governance, independence, and separation from the Indian Act as early as possible. We wanted it to be a transformational experience. 
Many other communities with treaties, including those in the Yukon, have followed a more incremental approach to the design and implementation of laws. We did it all at once with the community support and with the help of an incredible team of experts and advisors. In fact, we've also packed over 60 reg passed over 60 regulations to make our laws work as well. We completed a 40 or so item pre-implementation work plan where our laws were just one of those 40 items. We basically had land and economic development work, organizational work, and institutional building as major areas we were and are advancing simultaneously. I will touch on our lands and our governance work both to illustri illustrate how appropriate community engagement has really been a successful key to our progress. And we got 70% approval of our treaty. That was based on strong engagement practices. We continued those practices through our land management and economic development activities. And to give you a chronology on the land side, here's just a list of land issues our community has been consulted on. The land selection in our treaty, land components under our constitution that prevent the sale of lands under any circumstances, an interim measure allowing some crown land for sale and preserving some for treaty negotiations, which lands we should try and move from the agricultural land reserve during negotiations, creating a land code under the First Nation Land Management Act, and after the treaty, voting on a land use plan to provide a vision for the community and economic development of the lands between treaty ratification and effective day, the creation of and approval of land laws prior to effective day to deal with transition issues we faced due to changing from the Indian Act to our own laws, three votes on potential projects on new lands, and currently a neighborhood planning process to finalize where roads are gonna go, infrastructure, and other community amenities. We had to reinvigorate our whole land management regime to make sure, uh, to make it more comparable to municipal standards to ensure we're ready for economic development. Two of the three projects that went to the community were approved and we have proposals on how to develop both our industrial lands and our commercial lands. We created an economic development corporation about a year ago to drive our economic development. And I think the progress we're making is remarkable for a small First Nation with capacity limitations. Again, sorting out the appropriate level of community engagement has been key. If the community voted on every move we made, we wouldn't get much done. But we don't want to do things that would surprise our members either. Choosing key points to communicate, dialogue, and vote have been important factors of our success. So for example, the community can vote on any long-term disposition of public or communal lands but they don't vote on individual landholders' projects because they approve the land uses for those lands already. As you can see from the map uh, of our land use plan, much work has been done for and by the community. I should note that due to development pressures on our lands, we also needed to take this time to get the work done on our land and regulatory regime. To not get this component right would have meant a real risk of squandering our opportunities. The other area of remarkable transformation has been the operation of all our current institutions. This is such an exciting slide, right? Including our executive council, our legislature, our advisory council and judicial council. And I think what I'm seeing emerge is what I'd like to call a new culture of governance in our community, which has fundamentally changed how our people and how our governments react to each other and to the treaty. The whole reason for the restructuring of our government was to ensure more of our community could participate in decision making. We also needed to keep things affordable, so our legislature deals with specific issues of laws and budget. Our executive council is similar to the former chief and council, and we deal with the day-to-day -day aspects of our government. Our advisory council allows for participation from people who don't like running for office and ensures another check and balance on our governance, our government structures. The most important observation has, that I have has to do with our legislature. It has basically replaced the other levels of government over which we had no control. 
with respect to dictating our legislative environment, the set of rules that surround us and prescribe our permitted actions. Our legislature has sat twice now, a spring sitting and a summer sitting, and is preparing for its third sitting this fiscal year, which will occur in November. I've watched with great interest as the members on the legislature have been elected, have explored their role, and have begun to assert their authority. The 13 members who were elected ended up being representative of almost every large family grouping from my community. And we spent quite a bit of time discussing process surrounding the legislature with respect to its operations. We have quite a few cultural elements to it. One of the most successful has been a talking feather, a concept generated by our community, which legislators pass around to one another before speaking. And this is an important cultural element to include in our new government structure, but it also elevated the level of discourse by forcing members to interact directly with one another and provide them a little time to think about what they want to say before they say it. So the reaction of sitting of the sitting members in the legislature to our first debate was very powerful. They discussed and approved this year's budget, which was a law of our community. The act of discussing that bill showed them that they really do have power to make these decisions. I don't know if they really believed it before. There hasn't been much debate yet, as we are all still familiarizing ourselves with our own procedures and making it up as we go. But I expect they'll become more difficult and contentious in the future. But so far, the tone of our legislature has been very respectful. The legislature has an opportunity to make resolutions which serve as powerful indicators to the government and executive council as to the priorities of the membership. They ask for strategies on community safety and for reports on benefits accruing to members, both important and relevant pieces of work that have motivated us. And at the end of the session, when we asked for feedback on the operations of the legislature, what we received was a powerful endorsement of the process most members said they finally felt able to have a say, to have a, a voice with respect to their community's most important decisions. As I said earlier, we also have an advisory council which advises on laws, budgets, and policy. And it encourages community participation and is set up quite loosely now. But it can evolve over time to contain more traditional aspects of our, government, or of our governance should we choose to incorporate that. So we've created important feedback and accountability loops with our executive council and our legislature to ensure that the advisory council's advice is more than token. The budget deliberations have also had an important transformative impact on our administration's process. The impact of the scrutiny that the legislature will give our budget is transforming the way the budget's designed and the way our managers and director of finance do their work. We are big on reporting out to our members with respect to our departmental achievements, for example, but now we are designing our reporting structure to align with our budget structure so that we can tell the legislature they will have a certain outcome for a certain cost. This will facilitate debate. When we sit around in meetings with the administration, the focus of the conversation respecting budgets is now how it'll be received by the legislature, not on what is easiest or most efficient. It's absolutely the right focus, and it's driving more and more transparent and accountable outcomes at the ground level. Our other institutions and governance processes have also been transformed. We just held this year's annual general meeting six weeks ago, and I'm impressed at how it's evolving as knowledge by the community increases on areas such as budget and decision-making process, and we become used to our new accountability and reporting structures, the meetings are becoming much more relaxed and respectful. For example, the largest concern voiced at the AGM this year was the funding envelope that was provided for post-secondary students. But the way the concern was voiced was in a manner to suggest that next year we really need to increase and open up our budget in that area. And it was a forward-thinking approach that reflects the knowledge that they can impact decision processes. In other words, a productive discussion and the knowledge that their input will be productive. 
We continue to see how this evolves around us and we continue to communicate with our community as much as possible. We are now seeing our institutions and their processes become entrenched in our members' minds. The opportunities in our acts are becoming real options for them, including such alternatives as our judicial council and respective appeals, which has been tested this year. <coughs> the Freedom of Information Request Procedure, for which we have had one request so far. One of our key concerns with respect to all these institutions was to ensure that we were integrating our culture back into our processes, as it had largely drifted out of our institutions over the decades of INAC oppression. To that end, we formed a Standing Committee on Language and Culture, whose aim is in part to encourage, monitor, and support us in our ongoing efforts to make our systems culturally relevant. We will do this bit as we go, as we now have the luxury of time to think through these processes and relate them to our traditions. This new shift in our culture of governance that I have just described is what I think of as the most fundamental shift in our community. But we have advanced in many other areas as well. I think part of the shift is due to our increased meaningful role community members have in our new processes. I think this responsiveness has increased our people's confidence in our processes so far, but we'll have to remain diligent with our communications. With so much going on, there are plenty of miscommunication opportunities. But apart from that, we've seen a wonderful transformation. Our lands processes have been transformed. We're moving forward vigorously on several large projects, as I described earlier. Reforms to our many social programs are slightly slower, but we deservedly need to take our time to analyze each of these changes carefully. Thus far, we've used our treaty jurisdiction to make some changes to our post-secondary policies and to renegotiate some of our education delivery pathways. But mark my words, you'll see some exciting movement on the social programming side in the next couple of years in Tawasson. I'm convinced 18 months into our treaty, which is three weeks older than my newest daughter, which is ironic, that this aggressive approach was the right way to do it. And we haven't looked back, not once. And the fresh start aspect of our effective day took on a very important meaning. It was a real separation date for our people, more so than if we had adopted a more incremental approach. I wanna turn now to a specific question, one that has been raised a few times in respect of Tawasan First Nation. It is this theoretical specter of assimilation. I've heard rumors of critiques of the Tawasan Treaty that revolve around complaints of assimilation that we've become a municipality and that by removing the reserve status of our lands and the tax exemption and bringing in large economic development projects will end up destroying the fabric of what makes us proud to be Tawasan. And it's a complaint that my view is voiced by those who are scared to take positive steps forward that are required for change. To protect and revive our culture, our language, and our traditions, we must be strong. And the opportunity for Tuwasan is the development of our lands. We have the opportunity, with our incredible land base, to be an important contributor to local, regional, and national economies and supply chains. We have, through our final agreement, given ourselves the tools to do so. What it requires is not assimilation, but integration. They're very different things. We will make ourselves stronger as a nation by integrating with the Lower Mainland's economy from which we have been isolated from for so long. I can guarantee it'll be a lot easier to build a community and restore our language with real revenues to devote to those priorities instead of the insufficient funding programs we get from other governments. Also, paramount lawmaking jurisdiction on culture will be helpful too. Let me conclude quickly, as I'm concerned I've taken up more than enough of your time. I hope what I've shown you today is that treaties aren't just a theory. Treaties are real, and for Tuwasan, our final agreement is having real impacts on our community members. Every First Nation needs to figure out how to assess their current challenges and how to address them. For some, the treaty may not be the answer, though I believe it currently offers the most fulsome chance at reconciliation. The answer may be different for every First Nation. Others may rely, rely on tools offered by large corporations looking to do business on their lands, 
or perhaps tools of reconciliation offered by the provincial government. But whatever they are, it's important to consider the governance aspect in terms of practical change it can achieve. During the past year and a half, I've been afforded a unique opportunity to interact in regional governance processes, and it's reinforced my view of how INAC systems fail and how excluded First Nations really are from the political and legal processes that run this country. <coughs> in my view, any way that gets to the root of this is what we need to do in our communities to move forward. I provided you a number of examples where we have made compromises because the theoretical framework we are getting hung up on won't really impact the day-to-day -day lives of the members of my community. <coughs> so I think we need to challenge ourselves in order to move forward. It's not always fun, but the consequences of not moving forward are serious if we don't act. Thank you very much for your time this evening. I've also intentionally been a bit provocative to try and encourage dialogue. Although my bias is obvious, I do welcome other views. Thank you very much. You mentioned that it's probably common knowledge in the room that there have only been two treaties that have been ratified, finalized, and put into effect in the British Columbia Treaty process. What do you think are the stumbling blocks for First Nations as a whole? Why, why has this been such a difficult process? Oh, there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, it's a politically volatile process. And uh, the three parties to treaty negotiations, in my view, have had obstacles to overcome elections, for one example. But there have been other real initiatives that have hampered progress, whether it be the provincial referendum on treaties uh, is another example. Um, right now, the federal government doesn't have a mandate to negotiate fish. This is after 14, 15 years of the treaty process. It's mind-boggling to me that they would not yet have a mandate in place for, for those sorts of things. So there's all kinds of reasons why the process is bogged down, I think. And um, the governments have uh, reallocated their resources to the tables they think are going to make progress. That's been their latest focus for the past few years. and. Some more treaties are coming, but it is very time consuming. Can you tell us a bit more about what life in the community was like under the Indian Act? And you, you alluded to the, the oppression of the Indian Act and how so much of the treaty has resolved issues and helped you move forward. But at risk of going back in time and, and examining the pain. And I want to think about why those compromises were, were necessary in order to get past that particular point in history. Well, I, I think that was one of the biggest challenges of um, the community uh, considering our treaty. Aside from the tax exemption, they're worried, are we ready for self-governance? And it's kind of a chicken and egg thing because we're not taught about how the Indian Act system has been imposed in our communities. And so when our community members are mad at chief and council, they blame the chief and council instead of the structural issues of having that system, that uh, unaccountable system imposed on our communities. And so, you know, our members don't even know um, uh, how it was set up to fail to begin with. So I, I found that very challenging in our community. And in my view, no matter how much we tinkered with the Indian Act, with the Land Management Act, with uh, different bylaws, with different codes, um, the minister always, always had the final say. And for us to build a condominium unit in a highly urbanized area, uh, we faced nothing but opposition because people didn't want us to have that control over or that autonomy over our own land base. Um, so those other examples of how long it takes to get a mortgage on reserve for those that can, the lack of uh, economic opportunities are all linked to um, being hamstrung by the Indian Act system of governance. And I, I uh, fully believe that 
and so does the Harvard School study on first or tribes in the U.S. primarily, I guess, agree that the most economically successful First Nations are self-governing ones. So I uh, very, very strongly believe in First Nation self-governance. Well, if I'm if I may, I'd uh, like to uh, open up a couple of the lines of critique that have been hailed against you um, and your First Nation in pursuing the treaty agreement. And I've sourced three areas of dissenting voices that have come at you way, and I probably have missed some, but I'd like to just touch on a couple. Um, some of the criticism from within the membership of Tawasin. Um, there are a variety of things, of course, you mentioned uh, opposition to fee simple title and so on. Um, there were some charges of manipulation of the vote on behalf of Canadian or provincial authorities, and then also some concerns about environmental damage from port development and expansion. Could you respond publicly to either of those charges? Sure. Um, there has been lots of uh democratic process in our community for people airing their opinions on the treaty. And in fact, um, that was something we very much encouraged. We even um, paid for people to provide dissenting views of the treaty and provide that to the community. Um, what it comes down to, the biggest charge was that uh, how do you get away from potential financial benefits of the treaty and how can you ensure that won't impact the vote? So the biggest charge we received uh, criticism about is that we uh, were going to provide for our elders to receive a treaty benefit upon ratification. And some people were worried that that was uh, manipulating the vote. What we were instructed by our community when we were consulting on the treaty was not to blow the settlement on the whole community and uh, to make sure that the elders who've waited a lifetime had some benefits from this. So in our view, uh, it was what the community was asking us to achieve, and I think it's what uh, the NISCA did in, in their case. And some of those elders have passed away since ratification to effective day, and I'm glad they got to benefit a little bit from the treaty before they left us. Uh, they struggled so much in their life for our ability to uh, negotiate that treaty and get those rights. And I don't believe for a, min a minute uh, our community is naive enough to vote for a treaty over uh, some allegations of financial benefit or, or that kind of thing. So those were the allegations. Uh, I certainly don't lose sleep over what our community did. The show, the turnout for the vote was 95%, and 70% of those voted in favor of it. It's a pretty clear mandate. And we weren't offering people hundreds of thousands of dollars or anything like that to, to vote, or uh, it was a, an anonymous, anonymous vote as well. I have a question. I'm curious to know how you feel that uh, the government system that you put together is going to apply itself to the rest of the First Nations across the country. Uh, being said that, as you're aware, in the early 1800s, uh, the uh, treaties were written on the plains, and of course we get that $5 a year because the oil comes through that one foot of topsoil. Now, how do you feel that this is going to apply? Is it going to open up a, a possibly new talks? Is it going to help the First Nations across the rest of the country, or is this simply a you know, benefit of geography? Well, no, I, I think the federal government has its inherent right policy. It's willing to negotiate in different areas. It's happening in Quebec and other places. I think it's interesting in BC if treaties are too hard to get to because it's too much of a full meal deal. I think they should de-link self-governance discussions with the land claim settlement because I really truly believe that everyone will benefit from self-government agreements. So I think there are political opportunities to engage with the government we're meeting with um, groups from Northwest Territories that have land claims, but no self-governance agreements that are engaging in that process. And in fact, we meet with at least one First Nation a month who wants to know 
how uh, aspects of our treaty, how we reached it, and how we're implementing it, and what our governance structure is. And different communities will have different priorities and different capacity levels. We had to focus a lot on our land management regime. Our sort of education and social services laws are more aspirational than a huge drawdown of power because we're only 400 people. So it'll take time before we have that sort of um, threshold to, to make an economy of scale to do anything really meaningful in those areas. So, but we're more than happy to share experience with anyone who uh, wants to learn about it. And on the environment, um, we're very concerned uh, about how we move forward with development because we face the brunt of major transportation um, infrastructure, whether it be BC Ferry Terminal, the Superport, uh, hydro lines, uh, road, highway rights of ways, you name it. Um, it's carved up our little territory in, in a million pieces and it's forever uh, changed the environment already. So our vision is to be a model community of sustainable development. Hopefully we are able to achieve that. We have um, almost greenfield opportunity to use the best planning processes and technologies available should we be able to afford it. Um, generally the biggest challenge I think we face is not having enough resources to take advantage of those opportunities uh, because we're starting an economy from scratch basically. But that is the strong desire of the community to proceed in a sustainable manner, but also being realistic about what our environment is and how it's been compromised already. I saw another hand up. Thank you, um, Jen. It's a very uh, nice to hear you speak about the cross and the treaty. I'm from Hardy Bay, the north, and we're not even the treaty yet. But I'm glad to see that the band like hers has succeeded in uh, taking the very first steps of uh, self governance. I just want to know if, um, through self governance, if you have the power or authority to levy a surtax on all the traffic coming through your band. No, we tried to negotiate that. Uh, we do think we can make some headway on port related traffic because the strategic significance of our treaty lands. So that's something we continue to work on. Okay. Uh, I congratulate you, you all stuff and that's the work that you from a very good uh, consequence. I was wondering when you talked about um, how you did not want to be the same as local well government because you thought that didn't fit culturally. So I'd like to know what the differences are, how, how you ended up, in, in what ways have you ended up differently from a lot of them? So we have municipal type powers in land management, zoning, and, and that kind of thing, but we're not a creature of the provincial government like municipalities are. We also have social programming that are more federal and provincial in nature, whether it be child and family services, health, welfare, that sort of thing. So that puts us in a different realm than municipalities are at, at a very basic level. And can you um, impose property taxes? How, how do you um, generate the income to, to do the things you need to do? Um, it will be through property taxes and through uh, the proceeds of economic development of our communal land base. I think though that um, the property tax uh, negotiation was kind of complicated in that senior levels of government only recognized our ability to tax ourselves as a treaty right, which is constitutionally protected. The other taxing ability of our non-member residents is, uh, uh, was negotiated in the side agreement because they didn't want to concede that jurisdiction outright to us. But at the end of the day, we are still able to tax everybody on our lands, so. Related to that, I want to ask you another question related to um, 
a line of critique that has come from uh, a BC Conservative MP regarding uh, the status of taxation and representation for, as he says, about 700 non-Aboriginal people living within Is the First Nations. Is it my MP? <laughs> 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 uh, the MP of Delta has never supported the Tuasan Treaty, so... Um, but in your structure of governance, how have you uh, accounted for that? Yeah, um, it was a huge issue of concern, and I have to say that first, um, we have non-members under the Indian Act, and there is no requirement of uh, real representation. Uh, so in my view, what we've achieved under the treaty is a great improvement. Uh, we have created a tax authority where the members of our leaseholders have representation on and will approve expenditures in relation to, and, and the um, tax rates that are set. So they have real robust uh, powers to be involved in how taxes are set that impact them. The second area of the treaty is they have a constitutionally protected right to be consulted and consulted with a capital C because it's defined in the treaty. It's a very rigorous process. So we have set up a consult consultation committee of the leaseholders that we meet with twice a month probably. So they have great representation and we have better relations than we've ever had because the treaty has provided us to have much better processes. Um, they don't get to vote for our government. It's an Aboriginal government. And so we felt strongly that we couldn't have a majority non-native population have control of that. So we have a different model that we're testing out and so far it's working okay. Yes, so we're here. Hi, my name is Curtis. I actually know Tony, he's married to a cousin of mine. But anyway, just on that, um, that theme there, I mean, it's, it's the same type of concept where you have Canadian citizens living and working in the United States um, where they're taxed, and, but they're not, they don't have the right to vote. So you have the same kind of principles and concepts in place, as well as just based on the tone. Yeah, yeah. I pay taxes in both countries, actually. <laughs> I do not have the right to vote in both countries, that's correct. So you're taxed without representation? Yeah, and the other argument is that they have uh, federal and provincial representation. It's just not a local government representation they have. Well, I'm hoping to probe just a little bit more on this fee simple title issue because it's a tremendous sure. issue. Um, and Union of BC Indian Chiefs says, uh, mentioned this issue, um, not just in regard to your treaty, but in the treaty process in general, uh, about uh, their extreme concern about converting reserve land to, to fee simple. Uh, now, speaking from an American perspective, we had an experiment with this um, late 19th century to early 20th century called the allotment era. And the damage done and the land loss done was so extreme, we're still trying to, re to recover from it. Um, the land, of course, was lost through sales, through foreclosure, any number of, of possibilities. Um, so coming from that standpoint and that historical experience, um, as an American Indian tribal member, I have great concern about fee simple title. And you mentioned in your presentation that there are protections um, for the land. So I'm, I'm hoping to hear more about that. Yeah, it's... Um I mean, that's one of the ironic things that the Indian Act does is it protects lands from sale. Um, and we replicated that in our constitution. And could future Tuasan people make a poor decision? They could. Uh, but our current community has said that it's so fundamental, it's in our constitution, that we prohibit the outright sale of our lands. And that's the thing about owning your own land. You need to be responsible for it. And while I understand there's some fear about that, I do think we are capable of making those decisions um, and learning from other people's mistakes. Our community has said time and time again that we need to maintain our land base. Uh, but I think it's um, fundamental that we own our own land too. And Fee simple title is the greatest form of ownership in a North American system. And we've ensured that 
the Land Title Act has been modified to ensure there are checks and balances so that our lands can't be taken from us. And that was a major accommodation to get through the Modification Land Title Act to, to recognize our unique relationship with our land. So we think that um, although people are nervous that in theory it could happen, that we've taken matters into our own hands to ensure it won't. Are there other questions from the audience? I guess I just want to ask you about demographics. Are you a young band in, in terms of a uh, uh, very young population or are you an aging band? Very young. I think our last stats were 55% or uh, under 18. So the, the pure <laughs> pyramid demographics. Does the 400 member include the under 18s also? Yeah. And can I ask a, a quick follow-up? In terms of, do you have programs or objectives in terms of engaging young people in the government? Yeah, we're struggling with that. And uh, we're also struggling with, we understand the major sort of statistic for success is grade 12. So we really want to focus strategically on how to uh, ensure our youth succeed. Um, so those are things we're grappling with right now. But we have found, too, that there's, uh, an age group from 20 to 30 maybe we had a hard time speaking with, especially some of the younger men in our community were very angry and liked to complain about things but um, weren't engaged at all. Um, they're frustrated and angry. So we've had to be creative um, and we have younger people working uh, in our organization that can try and reach those people as well. We're experimenting with um, technology, Facebook, that kind of thing, to try and reach our youth as well. It's not easy, um, but what we have found so far is that that same group seems to be a little more hopeful about opportunities going into the future, uh, thinking a little bit more about entrepreneurial activities. Over the past number of years, we've really decreased our unemployment rates um, and that kind of thing. We're still suffer from underemployment, people need better quality jobs. But this past year as well, we um, went from three post-secondary applicants last year to, uh, I think it was 18 this year, and we were completely unprepared for that. It's like a 500% jump, right? We didn't budget for that, and so we got in heck for that. So those are all positive signals, I think, but it's so early, um, it remains to be seen how we do to that regard. And one final thing I'll say is I'm very pleased that our youngest member of executive council is 21 years old. And uh, uh, I think that's good succession planning to have youth on our government. And that's just on the executive council. We have other younger members on our legislature as well. And we have youth representation on our advisory council. Yes, sir. Um, I'm actually uh, um, not really uh, um, in favor of the treaty process and, and using that as a mechanism for Aboriginal people. And, and in our community, we um, we tried a couple of times to get into the treaty process, and the last time was 2003, 2004, something like where people voted against um, entering into the treaty process. But, um, me being a, been a past leader in my community, and, and I just want to say I appreciate um, the uh, the work that you did as a leader in your community to actually be successful and, and um, bring this to a closure for your people. Um, but my my question is around how do you how does your community define um, uh, benchmarks for success um, in your treaty and, and now that you're in post treaty. So I've always, um, I'm really big on trying to sort this out. What our community deems a success, is it income levels? Is it education levels? Is it proliferation of culture and language? Is it um, people's uh, satisfaction with our institutions? So we're partnering with the sociology department at UBC to try and do a benchmarking, benchmarking 
project to get community input on what we should measure, what are the important targets that we should uh, look after in relation to uh, uh, our measuring our success or our failure going forward. Um, and I'm a little bit frustrated that we're behind on that. I, um, my, I drive my staff crazy because I'm cracking the whip on, whip on all kinds of things, but um, we're really focusing on that now, trying to get uh, sort of some definition from the community about what we should be measuring. And just to go further to some other questions over here about um, uh, legislative powers, do you, do you have, um, with your, your treaty, do you have the power for creating legislation, let's say for education, or, and how does um, children and family services work on your treaty? Do you have um, powers for uh, removing children from an unsafe environment, for example, or is that still? We didn't take on um, uh, child protection where it comes to child removal issues because we're so small. That's something we want to work towards. But instead, uh, we did do a Child and Family Act and we gave a copy to the provincial government and they were a little alarmed. They're like, what do you mean you have a Child and Family Act? So it's forced us to enter into protocol discussions that better define roles and responsibilities and aspirations of the parties in relation to uh, child apprehension issues. And we think we're going to amend our legislation to um, acknowledge the need for oversight. So the uh, um, Mary Ellen Terpel Lafon's sort of role as child advocate, uh, bringing that into our tent and politically recognizing that as a valuable um, aspect, uh, that oversight aspect. So those are things we're exploring. But again, because of our size, we only some of those things are more aspirational in nature than, uh, than uh, being able to take down the full authority in that matter. For now. <laughs> Same, similar, I mean, um, we have aspirational things about uh, targets and that kind of thing in our legislation, but we think it'll be about five years out before we could take on something like an education authority or our, our own education district. We have that jurisdictional ability, but we don't have that capacity yet. Hi. Thank you very much for tonight's talk, um, Chief Fair, and congratulations on all your accomplishments. Um, I don't know how quite to say it, so I'm just going to try. But, um, with the land you're going to take out of the ALR, I'm assuming that you're going to be using it for economic development. And I'm just kind of wondering, is there any possibility of growing food for the nation, say, in the future? Um, my concern is peak oil, possibility of we won't get food the way we are having it now so into the future. Is there any way we can... Half the land we received will stay within the ALR. I understand there's a huge public policy concern about food security and agricultural land. Um, I think that uh, what ha what's happened for our treaty to facilitate economic growth um, is the tip of the iceberg as far as the other issues at play in relation to the ALR and what's happening with it. I think there are plenty of areas in Lower Mainland that aren't being used efficiently for agricultural purposes. You've got turf farms, you've got uh, golf courses, you've got all kinds of things. So I think the whole area of um, public policy in relation to agricultural lands needs to be looked at. And I know Metro Vancouver has recently done a, a, a study on that about what, what should happen. I think it's beyond Tawasson's um, sort of uh, power to fix it though. Um, and really, it's really challenging for us to even break into the agricultural market. It's so uh, focused on large, sort of uh, big agricultural crops that for an average member of our community to consider starting agriculture, it's a daunting prospect. We're still grappling with trying to sort out how we can 
uh, farmlands. And currently, um, they've, any agricultural lands we've had have been leased to other big farmers of the area. So it's uh, on the list of things to, to do and sort out, but it hasn't been at the top of the priority list right now. Uh, that brings about actually another really interesting question. Now, being that you have your own governance, um, hypothetically speaking, if you chose to say buy up a huge chunk of land allotment somewhere, would that also fall under the the, uh, the our jurisdiction? Uh, jurisdiction? In our treaty, we agreed to a predefined area that if we should acquire that, we have rights of refusal over those lands, that it would come under our jurisdiction. It's also within the agricultural land reserve. So we would have to, if we want to remove it, we would have to apply like anybody else does in the lower mainland. But it would still be within our jurisdiction if we receive it. If, <laughs> well, out of that predetermined area, which is not that big, because people are worried about my plans to take over the world. Um, <laughs> They, uh, and charge taxes on the yeah yeah highways. we have to um, we have to get permission from the federal provincial municipal government to remove it from their jurisdiction so it's possible um, in theory but uh, it's doubtful un unless you know the right circumstances arise that make sense for all parties. Any last comments, questions? Well, that might be a good place to wrap up. And I just want to express uh, personally and on behalf of uh, UBC our appreciation that you've come and joined us and shared your experiences tonight. I know I've found it really enlightening and uh, appreciate you coming and joining and speaking with us.